Quite a few people have said to me who've, who've read the book, I know a few journalists who've read it five or six times for their own work, and they always say that every time they reread it, they spot something that they hadn't spotted before. And I felt like that when I listened to your you know, narration of it, you would, you would suddenly recount a story, which of course I know well because I wrote it, but I'd completely forgotten it and forgotten the significance of it. And it might be a name of somebody who actually 15 years later, I suddenly remember was involved in another big drug case or, or you know, something else. So um, I think people will probably be mining it for quite a long time still to come. Once upon a time in the 90s, the Home Office asked an eminent sociologist to carry out research into serious crime. Though a professor at an old and venerable red brick university, he had been born and raised in a tough part of the East End of London and was one of the few British academics prepared to delve into the murk of the underworld. His work led him to spend time in Liverpool at the headquarters of Merseyside Police. During one visit, he happened to inquire about organised crime in the presence of a high-ranking officer. The officer bristled. We do not have organised crime in Liverpool, he thundered. Later that day, a young but streetwise junior detective took the professor to one side. We do have organised crime, he whispered, but we keep it in a box marked, do not open too difficult to handle. This is what happened when that box was opened. Peter Walsh, good to see you again. Good to see you again, Graham. This is an amazing book, isn't it? An amazing true story. It is. And um, I guess uh, from, from, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things, the more you dig into it, it's almost every fact you uh, uncover is more astonishing than the previous one. Yeah. What was the most surprising thing you found out when you were researching Curtis Warren and the whole story? It's a big story. Yeah, I, I, I think when you start off, uh, I mean, it, it came from, um, I guess, quite small beginnings from my own point of view, really. I, uh, I'd heard about this guy previously who'd um, walked from this huge court case in, in Newcastle when, when um, the customs had discovered... Customs and the police had discovered 900 kilos of coke, which was by far the biggest amount ever uh, in the UK. And uh, he he and others went up for trial and the case collapsed, basically, for a, for a variety of reasons. And then <clears throat> a few years later, he was arrested in uh, by armed police in Holland. And um, I went over to cover the trial along with a couple of other reporters. And, and that was kind of the genesis of the book, I think, really. We realised what an interesting story it was. I think from my point of view what was most surprising was what we learned about him that he, he you know you you have um, maybe a lot of people have an image of people who are rise up the drug world that they're sort of very violent very ruthless very um very sort of fixated and focused they run a, a you know a sort of hierarchical organization where they're the boss and everyone does what they're told and it wasn't like that at all really um you know, very personable guy, very intelligent guy, very smart guy. And the drug trade really works by, um, you have to do deals. The, the ones who are good at it are good are deal makers. They're not thugs. They're not, um, they're not violent. They, they sometimes have to use violence because it's an illegal world. And the only way you can protect yourself and police what you do uh, is, is illegally, obviously, but with your own methods. But the, the real skill is... Uh, which Warren perfected is is buying drugs as cheaply as you can in the source countries. So that would be Morocco main, mainly for cannabis, uh, Colombia for cocaine, Turkey for heroin, and maybe for things like ecstasy and amphetamines, it would be would be the Netherlands. Buy as cheaply as you can from as close to the source as possible, and then you have to sell it. So it's the skills of the the, the market trader really, rather than the nightclub doorman is what you is what you need. And he, he, he had that in spades, you know, the ability to make connections, do deals, get people to trust him. Uh, you know, he, was, he, he could work out prices in his head. He could remember phone numbers in his head. He could juggle all of these things. Um, so I think that was the most interesting. Yeah, it's almost like if, it, if he hadn't turned to crime, he would have been a very successful entrepreneur. 
had he had he had the opportunities yes i mean the background he came from and the time that he grew up you know it, toxteth liverpool late 70s early 80s mixed race guy you know it, it wasn't a good time there, there were there were not the opportunities that there should have been um there was a lot of racism from the police and for other elements of society uh, it was, you know, there were uh, unemployment in Liverpool at that time was, I think, the highest in England, uh, certainly. And that persisted for a long time. They had, of course, very bad riots in 1981, which further sort of damaged the reputation of the area. So, you know, if you had a job application for somebody from Toxteth or Granby, it, it would probably tend to go to the bottom of the pile, which is a great shame, really. And, and it shows you how how many talented people slip through the cracks, really, of our system, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, and, and end up doing things like this. But, um, yeah, he, he, he probably could have been, he probably could could have turned his hand and probably could still turn, turn his hand to almost anything. Yeah, yeah, because you, you put it into perspective in the book just how successful he was. In 1998, he made the Sunday Times rich list. I think he was down yeah. as a property developer, wasn't he? But he, yeah. actually, he actually made the Sunday Times rich list. He did, yeah. which was which was extraordinary. I mean, whether that was a bit of tongue in cheek by the guy who compiles the rich list, I, I don't know. He, he'd obviously heard about this guy by reputation. And, and certainly um, there are a, a few drug traffickers who should be on that list anyway. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah. and Warren just happened to be the one he, he picked out, um, which um, I guess was a double edged sword, really, because things like that make you a target for law enforcement, you know, that they they really don't like that kind of thing. Um, so uh, it, it, it never worked in his favour. And I'm sure he would always deny that he should have ever been on that list and, and so on. Um, yeah, yeah, because no one uh, really knew his true wealth, did they? He, he was so no, and, good at hiding the money and laundering it. And he, and he yeah. had Swiss bank accounts and he, he was very, very smart. Yeah, m money in places like Dubai, where once it disappears into the banking system there, you'll never trace it. Yeah. Um, and you know that's the that's the nature of of drug money, and it's it's actually a challenge for these guys because they make so much cash, and it is cash. It's it's very difficult to know what to do with it. Um, I, you know, I know one guy in, in another book I wrote who who was a kind of similar sort of guy to Warren, uh, complaining that in the end counting the money became a complete chore, uh, and he was he just got he was just sick of it. You know, even even it was just a pain. Uh, to count the stuff um, but of course you always had to count it so everybody knew they hadn't been ripped off and this sort of thing but uh, and then of course what do you do with it because if you leave it lying around your house it can always be found it can be stolen or you can be arrested for it so it actually is a, a pain I mean the, the the clever ones are good at moving it like Warren but they have to pay a price you know they they will go to these sometimes these dodgy bureau de change where you know well, most you people, say you, you say that in the book, which seemed like the most ridiculous way to launder yeah. money to me. It was not. It was it was so open for 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 corruption and so it it wasn't it wasn't Incredible. hidden enough. It was too out no. in the open, wasn't it? It was just no. They they go yeah. to these bureaus, so they'll they'll change. They they'll take they they literally daily take bags of cash down to London to various. Backstreet Bureau de Change, they would change them into quite often Dutch guilders. They would pay a big premium for it. The, the bureaus would, because they knew it, they denied it, but they knew it was dodgy money, most of yeah, them. Yeah. And then they would take the money over to Holland to pay the suppliers, usually in the, the guilders. And some of the, I think one of the advantages of Holland, there's a, there's a particular note, I think it's a 500 guilder note. So you can, you can change an awful lot of money into a small pile. Yeah, and but they, they, these things were so they were so unusual they were so rare these notes they were known as Bin Ladens because they were never they were rarely seen, but they <laughs> they they were quite sought after Bin Laden because you could put a pile of Bin Ladens in your back pocket, and and rather than carrying a bag full of guilders through customs and then being stopped and they asking you why you, why have you got a million pounds worth of guilders in your in your um, in your bag yeah, but it was a cottage industry Graham you know the the. From the laundering of the money, there would be guys literally going down on the train every day, West Coast Line down to London, changing the money, uh, do, making drops, coming back, doing it again the next day, going up to Scotland to collect the money from the buyers who, who'd taken heroin or whatever off them. They would then, they'd have all these Scottish pound notes, which of course nobody wanted, but which were legal tender, but nobody wanted them. They'd have to come back with them and try and change them. 
And they were doing this all over the country. It was a complete network. Every day, people going up and down the motorway, up and down the train system, just moving huge amounts of cash and drugs around. When you were in court and he was there, mm. what kind of sense did you get about the from the fella? What what vibes were, was he giving off for you? All that p pretty calm, pretty fit, uh, sweatshirt, jeans, casually dressed, smartly dressed, but very casual, very well groomed, um, quite. Uh, I don't know if the word is defiant, but quite strong in standing up for himself in his case. You know, he was he was fighting his innocence. He was his main complaint was that the evidence against him was tainted, that the the British had done some some devious and underhand things in gathering intelligence against him, which were against Dutch law and shouldn't have been allowable. And that these things had, had led to the progression of the case in Holland. So he was he was alleging that there was uh, Basically, dirty tricks had been employed against him. He wasn't, in effect, actually denying that he'd done things. He wasn't. He wasn't addressing that at all. His case was that the the case against him was flawed and should be thrown out. And um, and he was quite vociferous. He had a very good um, Dutch barrister, Han Yehai, who's you know fought cases in the highest courts in Europe. Um, but uh, he he. He never really stood a chance of, of getting off, but he, but he fought his ground pretty well, I'd have to say. Um, he must yeah, have been guy, confident because he, kind of, he was offered a deal, wasn't he? And he decided not to take it. He was offered a deal, I think it was for his, um, for his assets, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the money they were after. Seizing of them, yeah. 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 Um, no, he's, he's never been a guy to do deals with prosecutions. He's never been a guy to snitch on his fellow criminals. He's never been a guy to cooperate with law enforcement. And that is actually surprisingly rare. They all pretend to have a code that they, they don't talk to the law and they don't snitch and, uh, you know, a, a grass is the worst kind of humanity. But actually a lot of them do. Uh, they do it for protection. They do it to get rid of the opposition. Uh, they do it to get themselves out of a bad situation. But there's no evidence that he ever has at all. Um, and I think that's why he continues to have a lot of respect in his world. And when you were researching the book then, what kind of feeling did you get from law enforcement and the people who were chasing him? Because he was target one to them. Yeah, yeah. Did they regard him as a scum or was there respect for him from no, them? No, not at all. Again, they, really? they, yeah, res respect. I mean, um, one guy who used to listen to his, um, him and his gang, some of their tapped phone calls, um, said that they used to have them in stitches because the conversations were so funny. <laughs> um, and uh, um, and um, they, yeah, pretty much um, one thing they did say about me, he had one weakness. So he, he, he always liked to be around when a big deal was going down. So it's a, it's a kind of rule of thumb for the very top guys. Never be there when the drugs arrive or never be there when they're being, you know, you've always got to put a distance between yourself. But, but Warren liked to be around. I think that, that partly relates. He had this nickname, the Cocky Watchman, which was given to him by a, a friend of his, which is, uh, I think it's a Liverpool slang, which means somebody who's kind of ever vigilant and nosy, you know, the sort of um, parky or, or the, the watchman who's always sticking his nose in where it doesn't belong. And I think he had an element of that, that he always liked to be around, not necessarily on the plot itself, but in the vicinity. So they often knew if he was sort of driving around somewhere, seemingly for no reason, that something something was up, something was going on. But they never actually caught him in situ, you know, with 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 his with his hands dirty, as it were. Yeah, the book starts out that way, doesn't it? Talking about um, an incident at Burton Wood Services, yeah, which, which is expanded upon, and and uh, one of the guys staking out the thing sees him and i think in that one the deal doesn't happen because he smells a rat or he drives he drives into the service station car park yeah when there's a, a lorry which which was contained what was at the time the the biggest in, load of heroin ever discovered in the uk so that was part of the i think the cause of his reputation in a very short space of time he was linked to both the biggest cocaine importation ever and the biggest heroin importation ever so that tells you usually people who were involved in one world are not involved in the other. They tend to be separate, the heroin dealers and the, and the cocaine traffickers. Warren was huge in both. Um, but yes, he, he swanned into the service station, drove around a bit, 
I think he actually came in on the service road, which he wasn't supposed to use. He drove the wrong way in so nobody could follow him. But they, the surveillance were there watching the lorry and, and they saw him turn up and then, of course, he drove off and um, never showed his face again. In, in the end, they had to arrest the lorry, the driver, because they knew there was drugs on board and they couldn't let them go because they might have lost them and they might have gone into the system. But uh, they couldn't get they him because he wasn't directly linked they, to They him. couldn't get him because there was no evidence against him. He hadn't spoken to the driver. He had, you know, there was no connection but they, they, they knew he was involved. And he's doing these multi-million pound deals, but you say he showed up in the car. He didn't drive super flash cars. He wasn't in Bentleys. No, I mean, but he, he did like his... He, he often talked about um, flash cars and flash motors, but I, I think it was almost um, just kind of conversational with him. You know, he, 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 um, he knew when to be discreet and he knew when to be... when he could spend his money. But he certainly wasn't... Um, you know, blingy flash. He didn't wear loads of gold. He, he doesn't drink. He doesn't take drugs himself. He wouldn't be swigging, you know, crystal champagne at 500 pounds a pop in some nightclub. Um, he kind of did his socializing as well as his drug trafficking under the radar. And and again, he, he, he talked about that sometimes on the phone with his uh, with some of his cohorts about how um, they know that, you know, they being law enforcement, they know I'm not flash, don't they? They know I'm under the radar. And his friends said, yeah, they, they know. But he, 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 his reputation got um, so big at one time, despite his attempts not to be flash, that uh, one of his um, henchmen um, compared him to Calvin Klein. He said he was a household name like Calvin Klein. And um, <laughs> I, I think maybe in the end as well, he, he developed a bit of a God complex because he... He, grew, he complained um, once about how uh, nobody ever did what he told them. And he said, now I know how Jesus feel. Jesus felt. <laughs> nobody doing what he told them. Yeah. How did he get away with it for so long then? Um, I think, well, he, he, he spent quite a lot of time abroad. So, so that yeah. made him difficult to track. And for a while, they didn't even know where he was. Um, you know, a lot of it um, is, is done through proxies or in face-to-face -face meetings. And unless you can hear what's being said, um, you don't know what's going on. You don't know what's being arranged. Uh, there'll be nothing on paper. You know, there's no there's no audit trail left by these guys. Um, but he had the um, memory, didn't he, to remember everything? It, it, absolutely, Supposedly yeah, a photographic yeah. memory, yeah. Yeah, well, you, you can't really store that many names and contacts in your phone because it's going to be a giveaway if anybody gets access to your phone. But, of course, by this time, they discovered the trick of changing phones all the time, uh, and also, you know, buying the latest phones. And it was a, it was an arms race between them and law enforcement that um, new technology would come in, and um, law enforcement would have to learn to crack it before the criminals had, had sort of, you know, done big deals on it. So, um, you know, when um, when sort of satellite phones first came in and things like that, they were quite difficult. They didn't know. Well, when mobile phones first came in, it took a while. For them to to crack them, uh, the law enforcement, so they could um, they could clone pages. So if if these guys sent me messages to each other on pages, that was quite easy. But mobile phones proved quite tricky for a while, uh, and then they cracked them. But then the internet came in, and people were sending encrypted emails or or you know using different methods, and they had to get up to speed on that. So it was a constant sort of arms race, and. Um, you know, very cunning, very cunning operatives, and some of them very bright. How responsible were Merseyside police's failures for letting him get as big as he did? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a good question. Um, I guess you could say they, they've always got a lot on their plate. Um, but he did, he did rise very quickly. That was another... I guess, trait of the drugs trade. By the early 90s, the, the drugs market, I would describe it as it would finally matured as a market. So it started in the UK, really, in the 60s with the uh, cannabis and LSD and the sort of counterculture. But it was very small, mainly London-based originally, mainly student-based, and then it gradually rippled out. Um, by the early 90s, you know, drugs were everywhere and all sections of society were taking different kinds of drugs or had access to different kinds of drugs. So the market was um, sort of really mature then. And a guy could come along and literally, if you and some friends could pool enough money, you could go to Amsterdam, you could buy drugs cheaply, 
bring them home, sell them for a big profit, suddenly you're an international drug trafficker. So guys could come from under the radar, clean skins as they call them, could come from almost nowhere to suddenly reach reach big heights. So you can't necessarily blame the police for not spotting what these guys were doing because they could literally, they, they might have been sort of robbers and burglars one minute, two years later, they're multimillionaire drug traffickers. And it, you couldn't really chart that, right? That could happen in a couple of weeks. You know, that was, that was sort of the way it worked. So yeah. it was very, very hard to keep tabs on who was on the up and, and who was on the down, really. So yeah. I think it's just the nature of that market that it's, it's very difficult to always stay ahead of what's happening. You're always playing catch up. Yeah. Yeah, a big part of the book that I enjoyed was law enforcement tracking him, tapping his phone, transcripts of the phone conversations yeah. that he had. And what surprised me was that the the police and the, what's the drug enforcement agency called? The, the well, the, in the in the police, you had the the what were the regional crime squads, but it became the national crime squad. Then you yeah. had the customs customs investigation division. So yes, uh, they were sort of working in tandem. But it seems and that they were they were not working together for a long no, time until they got to until they realized and and you explain yeah. it all in the book they realized you know we've got to both all be on the same page here or we're not going to track this him and yeah. others down yeah Warren and others benefited from the tension between those two organizations in the early 90s there was an arm wrestle over who who really had primacy over drug trafficking to explain it very simply um Customs are responsible for what comes into the country, for protecting the country's borders and stopping prohibited or illegal goods from coming in. Once the stuff's in here and people are selling it, then it becomes a police problem. So the distribution is a police issue. But of course, there's an overlap between those two because sometimes the distributors are also the importers. Um, and, and from the customs point of view, sometimes the people who bring it in are also the people who are going to go and sell it. So the question is, you know, how do you, do you, how do you have those demarcation lines? In theory, the two agencies should work really well together. Uh, in practice, as so often in life, there are turf wars and people, people saying, no, we were on this investigation first or you, you, you've messed it up or why didn't you tell us that or why, you, why did you keep this secret from us? And Warren and his, his ilk benefited from that because they were able to kind of manoeuvre uh, the cracks in that relationship. Um, but you're right about the conversations they had and, and some of them... One of the big challenges they had was that they had to be able to translate Scouse backslang, which is this way of talking and putting random syllables in, into words. And, and these were Dutch ever... people. English wasn't their first language. Yeah, yeah exactly. So the Dutch, would, the Dutch would doubly, I mean, it literally was double Dutch to them. They, 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 they struggle with the Scouse accent. They struggle with the phraseology. Uh, but then the backslang completely threw them. Um and, uh, and and when you hear people speak it, it's it's really they speak it really quickly as well. So unless you are trained, and in the end they had some uh, British cops and customs guys who could speak it and, and could sort of decipher the conversations, but it threw them completely. And there was all sorts of funny stories about them hearing things and and not being or. But even it was just British phraseology, uh, like um, the the Dutch had heard one conversation from a guy. Uh, who something was going wrong in Holland and he needed to come over and sort it out. He said, right, I'm getting on my bike tomorrow and I'm coming over. So they were, look, they told the British to look out for a bicycle coming through customs. And the British said, what are you talking about? And they said, this, this guy is coming on his bike. And we have to, which they had to explain, or getting on your bike meant, you know, I'm yeah. hurrying up. Yeah, so there was all sorts of things like that, yeah. The work that must have gone into researching and then putting this book out must have been not as three writers. Is that why? Is that Fortunately, why? There fortunately, are three? there were three of us. Um, yeah, the demarcation line. So my, my friends who, who I wrote it with, Richard at the time was the crime reporter for the Daily Post newspaper in Liverpool. And uh, Tony Barnes was a um, presenter at Granada TV. And they both had sort of different areas of expertise in this in this field. So uh, the way we worked it is they largely split a lot of the research and the interviews was was done by those two. And my sort of main contribution, apart from some research and interviews myself, was to pull it all together and, and, and write it in, in a single style, if you like. So so it didn't look like it had been written by three people. So that was that that was the kind of way we we broke down the um, uh, the way it was done. And I probably had the best of it because it was a lot of uh, fun to write. I bet. I mean, it's an amazing. It was an amazing book 
for me to read. I know it's been out as a book this for a little while now. How yeah. did you find the experience of converting it into to audiobook form? Um, it sort of brings it all to life again, Graham. Yeah, it's, it's he hearing it again is almost like hearing the story afresh. And um, when you talked about the research earlier, quite a few people have said to me who've, who've read the book, I know a few journalists who've read it five or six times for their own work. And they always say that every time they reread it, they spot something that they hadn't spotted before. And I felt like that when I listened to your you know, narration of it, you would, you would suddenly recount a story, which of course I know well because I wrote it, but I'd completely forgotten it and forgotten the significance of it. And it might be a name of somebody who actually 15 years later, I suddenly remember was involved in another big drug case or, or you know, something else. So um, I think people will probably be mining it for quite a long time still to come. Well, thank you very much for choosing me to narrate it. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, it is a fascinating story. It's a big story, and it goes yeah. all over the world. You know, we mentioned Holland, but it goes through Colombia as well, even Australia. I mean, it really, yeah, yeah. His, his tentacles reached a long, long way. He, he's yeah. been described as, I think the Daily Mail described him as the Escobar of, of UK, and it's probably about right. Uh, it's when probably fair enough, yeah. Yeah, or yeah. when you listen to the audio book. Now, you've got some yeah. codes. If someone has watched this far, they're clearly yeah. interested in the audio book, and you've yeah. got the chance for them to get a code so they can download it for free. How do they do that? Absolutely. So if you go on to, uh, I think, is it Audible or ACX? You, you mm -hmm. know, may know better than me, Graham. Audible, can yeah. Be Amazon Audible platform. And um, so the thing to do is if you uh, hear this podcast and you want to just send me uh, an email uh, with uh, cocky in the subject line. Uh, yeah, the title oh, cocky in the subject line, yeah. I, I'll send the, the first the first five people to email uh, email me. I will send them a code and they can just enter the code on the Audible site and they get a free download of the audio book. Right, there's um, no strings the, attached. You don't have to give a review, but it'd be nice if you did, but you don't have it to. Would be lovely. It's, it's absolutely free. This is, this is a sure. way of getting the book for free, but you've got to be quick. Now, what is the email address they need to, to send that message so to? So it's very simple. It's, it's the name of the publishing company. So it's just info at milobooks.com. Milo M I L O. And um, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll put that address in the in the notes in the description. So just down below there, it'll just be there on its own. It won't say why it's there. So you have to have watched the uh, the interview, but you'll just see it. There'll be an email address down there. Good luck. I hope you're one of the first five with that. What's next for Peter Walsh? Um, I have a new book out this week, Graham, which yes. is called The Betrayer. Yeah. Uh, it's written with a guy called Guy Stanton, who was a customs undercover drug investigator who met Curtis Warren, actually, and he relates the story in the book. I met him a couple of times. Um, didn't, in the end, uh, do any further work on his organization, but worked against people um, who, who Warren knew. And it's the story of, of his career. Basically, for 10 years, he, he posed as a, a London gangster who ran drug trafficking organizations. And so he was able to infiltrate the very top of the drugs trade. I mean, literally, you know, he was going to places like Pakistan, the Middle East, Colombia, Venezuela, dealing with the very top echelon and feeding all the intelligence back to operational teams at Customs who were building cases against these guys. So that's called The Betrayer. It's out in paperback and ebook, and it's just come out this week. Brilliant. Well, if it's half as good as Cocky, it'll be brilliant because uh, Cocky is a terrific listen and it's a terrific read, whether you go for the audiobook or you want to go for the, the paperback or the Kindle version. Check it out. It's called Cocky. It's about Curtis Warren, Britain's biggest drug baron. Peter Walsh, thank you so much. Thank you, Graham.